I had the Everest bug ever since I was 16 years old and I climbed my first alpine peak in Peru and Bolivia. I remember standing on the summit and I was standing above the clouds. It was a magical moment and I remember thinking, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life and one day I want to climb Mount Everest. This is a dream. This is too big a dream. This is too big a dream for a boy at that stage, a 19-year-old, a teenager, to have. It, it was a dream, but we weren't going to try and, and, and thwart that or denigrate that in, in, in any way. We all sort of thought, yeah, cool Rex, go climb Everest, but I don't know if we really took him seriously. When Jesse Martin sailed around the world, he was just 18. I thought, if he can do that, I can go and climb Mount Everest. So I set about climbing as many peaks as I possibly could in preparation for climbing the highest mountain in the world. I love stepping out into the unknown. But there are times when I ask myself, what am I doing out here? This, this, this slope's really, really bloody dangerous. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't an adrenaline rush in the mountains. But it's not just about that. It's about stepping out of the tent on a clear morning, looking out over the range, and it's for those moments I feel truly alive, and that's why I climb. Mountain climbing is physically and mentally exhausting, but once you get to the top, it's just an indescribable feeling. It's deceiving in the mountains. You are surrounded by amazing beauty. But you have to keep reminding yourself of the constant dangers that do exist. So you spend all this time and all this effort nurturing them from tiny babies, school, the whole bit. And then they decide to go and hang perilously off some cliff somewhere. It's difficult to cope with at times. Is that a bridge? No, I wouldn't say it's a bridge, I'd say it's a powder bridge, but if you step on it, you go straight to it. You can see the, the edge is right here. You can see that's hard. You can see that. Whoop. It's a harrowing um, experience when he's out there, for certain. I think we've learned just how big the scale of these mountains actually are, uh, and just, uh, how strong the forces of, of nature, nature can be. The weather is something that is completely out of your control. It can change so quickly. One of the biggest obstacles in mountain climbing is the weather. But I believe with the right conditions, I could summit Everest on my first attempt. I've climbed with Rex many times and I've seen firsthand how much he wants to get to the top of every mountain that he climbs. I can certainly see why Everest would become a passion for him. Yeah! All right! You made it! You're on top! Woo! Climbing is what Rexy lives for and for me I've been really privileged to have been with him along the journey so far.
It was time to take my training to the next level. I decided to climb the highest mountain in Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro. We're about 3,800 metres. I look outside and there's just a, looks like the moon actually, very rocky, very barren. I underestimated how cold it could be on Mount Kilimanjaro. At times it was minus 15 degrees, with a wind chill factor of minus 25. Well, it's about midnight, freezing cold. We just got up and uh, we're going to be pushing for the summit now. It should take us about five to seven hours or so. On the roof of Africa now, so I'm pretty pleased about that. It's like five in the morning, the sun's just coming up. I was thinking to myself, if this is what I feel like on Kili, I can't imagine what I'm going to feel like on Everest. But it also made me realise that if I was going to have a realistic shot, I had to be a lot stronger. On average, climbers lose between 10 to 15 kilos on Everest. So it was important for me to gain weight and build up muscle mass. You've got to be physically fit, but you've also got to be mentally prepared. When you're exhausted, it's your mental strength that will keep you going. I was training seven days a week and I was due to leave for Nepal in less than two months. Problem was, I hadn't secured all my sponsorship yet. Okay, yeah, right. Uh, okay, so there's, is there no point in, there's no point in, um, in calling back Julie or anything like that? Okay, okay. No worries. Yeah, thanks very much for your help. Cheers. Bye. Welcome to the world of me. It's just another one. You know, you call them up. No, best of luck. Best of luck. Best of luck. We were supportive, but the behind behind the scenes, there was a fair level of blooming anticipation mm. and fear. By this stage, Rex was going to go and do it come hell or high water. He was going to have a go at this thing. Certainly Everest has become an obsession for many climbers, but for Rex I think it's different. For Rex it's about proving to himself that a dream he has had for many years is possible to achieve. Fifth, oh, yeah, sensational, yeah. <laughs> That's great news. Wow, yes! That is awesome news, that is so good! Oh my god, that's good. That is so good. That's seven months of work. Seven, like, seven months of work. I made the decision to head back to the New Zealand Southern Alps to round out my training. They often get hit by big storms, so they provide a great training ground for Everest. Yeah, it's when when he was training in New Zealand, that was that was hairy stuff because people were people four people died on that mountain just at very similar time and and we heard later Rex had gone out to rescue somebody caught in an avalanche and it became much clearer that this was a forerunner for what he was going to do next, and I thought it was damn selfish in, in many ways and then I saw the movie Touching the Void and I got really angry thinking just how selfish is this? And it was only when I um, thought about well hang on isn't my reaction fairly selfish too in him not wanting to go um, that I started to come to grips with with what he was doing. I guess climbing to a certain extent is a selfish sport but I really wanted to go out and do it. And although Everest is the pinnacle, the highest mountain on earth, that's not the only reason I wanted to climb it. <coughs> it's about the history of the mountain, and I wanted to go there and deal with the pressures, the ups, the downs, and experience it for myself. I, I just can't really understand the, I sort of can, and but no, I don't really understand the drive to climb up to the and a mountain that's so inhospitable. Kosciuszko might be a whole different story, but 
not a not a huge one like that. Some people think climbing is a, as a death wish, but I think it's all about living life and getting out there and experiencing as much as I possibly can. So the helmet cam's ready to go. Great. Hopefully, I mean. So I mean, will you take? Will with your helmet cam, you'll be carrying your your VCR around your neck. Yes, I'll be camera. carrying my video camera inside my down suit. Uh, just dangling from your neck? No, inside a pocket inside my down oh, suit. Oh good, oh good. God, it's more weight. Yeah, everything's heavy at the moment. And everything will be heavy, it's not going to get light. I'll probably be up all night organising gear, last minute logistics and packing my bags. Nevertheless, in good spirits now, earlier I was feeling really, really down and really overwhelmed but I think I'm getting on top of it now. The house is still full of gear but I think I'm slowly but surely getting on top of it so it's all good and I don't really have time to speak to you at the moment so I'm gonna keep packing. I find it hard to believe that I'm actually here, in Nepal. Leaving the pressure of sponsorship behind me, I can now finally focus on the journey ahead. I can't wait to get on the mountain and start climbing. For so long, I've dreamt about this place and the climbers that have come before me. And here she was. Oh my, Everest for the first time and it looks unbelievable. It's Awesome! 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 I just can't wait to get out there and get on it. The first part of the journey starts in Lukla, a precarious airstrip located on the edge of a cliff. Some climbers fear the steep landing more than the climb ahead. One tonne of gear is loaded onto yaks for the journey to base camp. I start the 10 day trek winding my way through the picturesque villages dotted across the Kumbu Valley. But it doesn't take long before I start to feel the effects of the altitude. It's just on the road to a dream and nothing feels better than that. So even while I am a little sick, well, I am feeling the altitude a little bit. All the work that I put in back home, all the work, all the time, all the effort, well, while it hasn't paid off quite yet, it's very close. And for me, that's awesome. Just awesome. you can't help but feel spiritual in the mountains. Monasteries are found throughout the Kumbu region where traditional Buddhist ceremonies are held. Mountaineers often visit them to be blessed by the local lamas. The Sherpas believe if you respect the mountain gods, they will protect you. As we continue upwards, prayer flags are strung across the Himalayas sending prayers to the mountain gods. Two days walk from base camp, we come across the stone monuments of Sherpas and climbers who did not return home from Everest. It's intimidating and serves as a solemn reminder to take nothing for granted on this mountain. Now at the top of Gokio Ri, we're at 5,300 metres. We've come up from the town of Gokio, and right behind me, with its summit in the cloud, is Everest. To its right is Lotsi. To the far right is Makalu, and up the valley is Cho Yu. So we're really on the roof of the world. It's amazing to think that in a month's time, I'm going to be trying to climb to the summit of that mountain, Mount Everest. It's daunting, but at the same time exciting. 
Base Camp is the staging platform for around 20 different climbing expeditions. Surrounded by some of the most experienced climbers in the world, I meet Ed, who becomes my friend and climbing partner for the rest of the expedition. We all share the same goal, to get to the top. But everyone has their own personal reasons for being here. For me, Everest represents the ultimate mental and physical challenge. For Ed, it's to say a final goodbye to his father who recently passed away, driven by the desire to take his father's ashes to the top of the world. Sherpas are the backbone of the climb. Dasona Sherpa will be climbing with me to the top of the world. He's been to Everest 12 times and summited five times. Without him, I'd have much less of a chance of reaching the top. The Sherpas believe Mount Everest is the home of Chungalungma, the mother goddess of the earth. Before making our way above base camp, a puja ceremony is held, asking permission to climb her and bring us back safely. Offerings are made, and we place our crampons and ice axes on the altar to be blessed. Juniper burns to cleanse and purify one's soul. As the monk chants, we throw rice into the air as an offering to the goddess of the earth. Prayer flags are raised, bringing a sense of peace to what we're about to attempt. Now we can go into the mountain and start climbing, so absolutely stoked. <laughs> Eddie, yeah. let's make this a yeah. safe one, eh, buddy? <laughs> Cheers, let's man. get to the top of the world. <laughs> We enter the Kumbu Icefall for the first time. This will be one of many trips through the unstable blocks of shifting ice. It's nicknamed the Suicide Popcorn Bowl by climbers. It's a scary place, the Icefall. It's full of apartment-sized blocks that can fall over at any time. The icefall is where most people come unstuck on Everest. It's part of the climb that's completely out of your control. More climbers have died here than anywhere else on the mountain. We've been crossing crevasses that are seemingly bottomless, bridged by aluminium ladders tied together with rope. Look at these seracs that we have to pass under. Any bit of those could break off at any time, causing probably tons of ice to come down on our heads. So mum, I urge you not to watch this tape. <laughs> I think they've got more testosterone than brain cells. But apart from that, um, I suppose they're trying to prove something to themselves. They're trying to prove that they can achieve this. There is a fine line between obsession and passion. You have to know when to turn around. There's just too many people up here on the hill. We're gonna get out of here before this place becomes one big shit fight. Uh, there's gonna be about plus 20 people wrapping down on these single nine mil ropes. And uh, I don't wanna be in the middle of that. It's one sketchy place. Early on in the expedition, a climber falls in the ice fall and breaks his leg. Guy in there, broke his leg, being evacuated down at the moment, so he's still got a hell of a long way to go. At altitude, a broken leg can be a death sentence. Fortunately, the Sherpas are able to rescue him, but if he'd been higher on the mountain, it could have been a very different situation. Most important, you don't get yourself once again into a rescue situation. 
Above base camp, helicopter rescue is out of the question. Even at base camp, it's a risky venture. In the thin air, the rotor blades have nothing to bite into. Helicopter carnage from previous failed attempts is scattered around. We as climbers know the risks we take. If we weren't prepared to take those risks, we wouldn't be in the mountains. Climbing by the south side route as Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay did in 1953, the team sets up four additional camps above the Kumbu Icefall. We will travel between these camps each time tagging a higher camp in an effort to acclimatise our bodies to the thin air readying ourselves for the summit bid ahead. This camera on. It's absolutely shattered at the moment. Um, beautiful view though, and uh, not much wind, which is good. Uh, making some dinner. 6,000 metres, melting some snow. It's quite a um, tedious process, you could say. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes to melt a litre of water if you uh, don't really have some water to put in the pot. It's just, in the mountains, you've just got to be patient. You've got to be patient with the weather, you've got to be patient with cooking, you've got to be patient with the conditions, you've got to be patient with the climatisation. This mountain is one big patience mountain. You can never totally relax. The air is often punctuated with loud crashes as avalanches thunder down off the peaks above. I've just heard a major rock fall behind the camp at Camp 1 here. Um, it's a bit concerning because there's a big ridge that runs up towards the west ridge of Everest and uh, it's got some big seracs on it and some pretty large boulders and things that can come down. A bunch of rocks just came down and, you know, not more than 100 metres away from the tents that they stopped. So, you know, if a big uh, a big avalanche or a big serac break or rockfall came down, the, the camp could be uh, jeopardised by that. So, I don't think, you know, Camp 1 is such a safe camp. Collected a whole bunch of gear, skis, uh, down suits, warm gear, thermals, all sorts of stuff, extra food, and hauled it up to Camp 2. I took my skis to Everest to fulfil a dream of mine to ski on such an amazing mountain. Cutting down. I just skied down part of the Western Coon. While it was very icy, it was an amazing ski. My God! <laughs> Camp 2 is situated below the Lotsey face, a 45 to 50 degree wall of ice. From Camp 1, it's about a five hour journey to climb to Camp 2. It offers the basic comforts and acts as an advanced base camp for climbing on the upper mountain. As we ascend, it is important for us to recognise the signs and symptoms of altitude sickness and learn how to manage it. We are trained to use a portable hyperbaric chamber. Okay, well, we're gonna let, let the pressure down, Mike. Where its function is to simulate a reduction in altitude by a few thousand meters. I like it, can we go back? <laughs> As you move higher on the mountain, the weather becomes more extreme and less forgiving. It can be clear with no wind, and 10 minutes later, it can be cloudy and blowing 150 kilometers an hour. jet stream is absolutely blasting the summit of Everest. You can hear it from down here at Camp 2. It's just... You can see this, the jet stream cloud as it, as it hits the mountain. It's just forming this huge cloud that's sort of tumbling in behind it. And uh, you can see the winds are in excess of 70 to 80 knots. And, uh, you know, if you're up there now, you'd be blown off the mountain. As soon as the weather clears, we will ascend from Camp 2 to Camp 3. As you continue upwards, your pulse rate goes up 
and your blood oxygen level drops. This is a pulse ox. This measures just the oxygen in your blood. At the moment you can see the oxygen level in my blood is at 72% and my heart rate is pounding. It's going at 122 beats a minute. Acclimatisation helps to increase the number of red blood cells, allowing the blood to carry more oxygen. Certainly everybody acclimatises differently, but what is clear is above 8,000 metres you're in the death zone. In the death zone, every hour you spend there, your body is dying. Your brain swells, it becomes difficult to make decisions, your ration goes out the door, you can't sleep, you can't eat, it becomes difficult to even drink water. If we were to fly to the summit of Everest from here right now, we would be dead within minutes. We make our way up to Camp 3, halfway up the steep Lotsey face. As part of our acclimatisation, we'll stay here one night. You can hardly breathe up here. There's just no oxygen. Climbers think this camp is pretty much the worst camp because it sits on about 45 to 50 degree slope. Tents are very small and you don't get much sleep. Had a hell of a morning coming up here, climbing the lotsy face. It's like one step in front of the other, one step in front of the other, sucking on air that just doesn't do anything for you. So we're in this shitty little camp. The tent's about the size of a matchbox. Seracs are above us that are loose and dangerous. If you step outside, you're on about a 45 to 50 degree slope. The wind outside now blowing about 40k an hour. It's blowing spin drift, the fresh snow from last night, all over the place. So as soon as you open the tent door, you get a face full of snow and everything gets covered. So let's just say this is not the nicest place to be at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to describe it is just miserable. You can't even sleep side by side in the tent together. One person moves, you wake the other person up. I guess at least we had some gourmet food. Oh. I just got down off the Lotsey face and uh, just found out an avalanche has taken out the whole of Camp 1, the complete whole lot, all our tents, everything, um, all our gears missing, gone. There's some seracs above Camp 1, they look pretty stable but obviously they weren't and uh, they just ripped through it at about 5.15 this morning and, uh, and there's nothing left to the whole of Camp 1 of the Mount Everest climb so it's, a, it's an amazing no one's died. Here's a scene of destruction. The IMG Cam 1. There's nothing left, it's completely flattened. The Sherpas are digging out the camp now. There were about six people there at the time, and they just got completely maytagged, thrashed for about 100 yards down wind from the avalanche. And some of them had, one of them had a pretty severe injury to his back. It was a Sherpa that uh, we managed to organize a rescue to bring down. I have to say, I've never seen the devastation in the mountains uh, like that avalanche did to Camp 1. Even for experienced mountaineers, the odds have shown that one in every 12 people who reach the top don't come back. This is a difficult mountain to be on. Some sad news yesterday. Um, a climber died in the ice fall. Uh, wasn't clipped to one of the lines, fell down a 30 degree slope and into a crevasse and uh, plunged about 20 metres to his death. This mountain doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care how much experience you've got. If you're in the wrong place in the wrong time, you can end up hosed and it's just not a good, not a good feeling to walk past a dead body like that. It's the reality of mountain climbing and if you're not prepared to deal with it, you shouldn't be here. One of my Canadian friends I met here, one of the hockey guys, he pushed a little bit too much and uh, he uh, died yesterday. And it was just sort of, you put everything in perspective. You have to have a lot of energy to make this mountain, you have to have a lot of luck, and you have to have a lot of desire. And so after yesterday, my desire probably is not quite as strong as it should. And after talking to my wife today, she says, come home, uh, it's probably a fair enough call. 
Well, this morning I woke up to the news that Caroline had uh, sprained her ankle on the walk into base camp. Don't, don't rush, Caroline. Don't break it any more than it already is. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly believed with all my heart that my presence would help him on his climb. Bye 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 dude! There you go! <laughs> so, the, the royal we this road. Yeah. This is how I do the Himalayan. The Himalayan princess being carried up the slopes. What's going on, Carolyn? This is base camp wash washing machine. Washing my clothes. I was gonna say Ed stunk him. yesterday though. Yeah. I sat next to him during the movie. <laughs> oh my god. It smells good now though. It's nice and clean. I wish we really talk, but... Oh boy, did he stink. <laughs> well, it's now late April. I've been in Nepal for about two and a half months or so. I uh, got about a month ago of the trip and uh, feeling pretty manky at the moment. I had a look in the mirror today for the first time. Uh, it's not my mirror, it's Ed's mirror. And uh, it will feel pretty dirty. I've grown what I think is the biggest beard I've ever had, a uh, bum fluff beard anyway. So I'm um, pretty proud of that. And I haven't washed clothes in about a month or so. <laughs> Mum, you didn't hear that. And uh, I'm feeling pretty disgusting. I haven't had a shower in about a week and a half. And uh, so things are going really well. <laughs> um, Everything's everything's working out fantastically. Uh, we're going to go up to Camp 3 tomorrow, then go back down to base camp, rest up in base camp, have a shower, wash some clothes, and uh, and then uh, position ourselves for a summit attempt. After weeks of going up and down between camps, the team waits at base camp for a suitable weather window to attempt the summit. It's safe and fast, because speed is going to be safe. Even an experienced mountaineer like Ed, who is an expert at roping, practices his skills. Yes, I'm still on. Now I'm on the anchor. Now I'm off. Still on. Still on. Still on. Still on. I'm always on. Up until now, our acclimatization rotations have seen us go as far as Camp 3. We'll only go to Camp 4 once. At this altitude, your body is starving for oxygen. Here, your equipment has to be flawless, or your summit attempt is over. Testing mask and regulators for a proper fit, and to make sure our goggles don't fog up. We'll be issues these for the rest of the climb, so you gotta make sure these are right. They'll make or break your summit attempt. I'd never used oxygen before, and at first I found the mask to be actually quite suffocating. Modified my goggles to fit around the oxygen mask by putting an extra bit of foam on the on the end. But once I get used to it, it will help me breathe up high. It's the oxygen conversion chart. How many litres you can have your oxygen bottle running on and how many minutes it'll last for. It's essential to know how much oxygen you've got left in your bottle when you're up high and hypoxic and not thinking straight. It's a pretty bloody good idea to memorise most of these numbers, which is going to take me a long while. Many of the conversations around camp centre around oxygen. At $500 a bottle, it's an important commodity on Everest. I don't, if I'm, my rate is lower than the average, I don't want to pay the price. Yeah. Right, I don't want to suck on a quarter of a bottle because I've, you know, not, not, not smoked them at at Camp 3 and done one liter a minute on the way up through the yellow band. Yeah. Have some joker who's done it at four liters a minute and sucked his whole bottle down. Yeah. And when I get to the south call, that dude switches Crawl with me. Crawl your tent, bring your bottle in there with you to sleep. Just don't, don't. Nobody messes with it. If anybody too. touches it, I'm going to swing at him. The other major concern I had was providing my body with enough energy to reach the summit. Holy moly, Drax. Are you kidding? No, not at all. I'm making sure I got what I need, mate. Didn't all your right. mother teach you when you were little not to share? Look at all of this. Look at all of this. I want some. <laughs> this is not a water bottle. It's absolutely not a water bottle. It is a pee bottle. And this prevents me from going outside into sub-zero temperatures at midnight. I pee in this bottle. And then in the morning, I come and empty this bottle. 
It has been known that climbers have mistaken the pee bottle for the water bottle and made a uh, seriously bad mistake. After another 10 days and a fourth rotation, we're back in base camp. It's the 12th of May now. Uh, we've had a few uh, close calls with the weather as to whether to push for the summit or not, but uh, overall the weather hasn't been good enough, the jet stream hasn't abated, and the wind is still smashing the top of Everest. Yeah, Waiting is tough. You have to find ways to keep yourself entertained. Fed up, I decide to shake off the boredom and the base camp blues by practicing my ice climbing skills. During the other times, I had my laptop which was my connection to the outside world, my family and my friends. It's cold and swinging. It was a lifesaver just being able to be in contact with the people you love. Hi Mum, it's me. When I think about the communication, it was, it was, it was so important, it was so vital and it was so fleeting, and then you didn't know he was off. Um, but thank God we had the sat phones, because without those, at least the whole thing became so much more bearable. I actually go and write the best parts of the emails on my sleeping mat, so when I'm, when I'm high up on the mountain I can you know, read over them and get motivation and get you really driven. It makes me really motivated and driven to go for the summit and achieve my goal. At the same time, it makes me really want to come home to them as well. Namaste, namaste. We've been waiting for a suitable weather window for two weeks. Sitting under the shadow of Everest is frustrating when every weather forecast you get seems to be worse than the last. Forecast models are all over the place on when the winds will increase and what speed. I remember thinking to myself, if this weather doesn't improve, my dreams just slipped right through my fingers and I have no control over it whatsoever. Ed and I decide to take the risk and go to camp too. Time is running out and this may be our only chance to attempt the summit. We keep getting these forecasts saying, you know, there's going to be a window, there's going to be a window. And it's really getting me down at the moment. Just thinking, you know, it's the 27th now. The 27th, man, it's... We need a weather window fast, otherwise we're not gonna make this summit. And at the moment, it just doesn't look hopeful at all. But there's no question that our original weather window is pretty much slammed shut in our face, over. I've put two years of my life, or two and a half years of my life into this climb and getting the sponsorship and going through all those ups and downs and it doesn't seem right now that you know we've come this far and we're not gonna even get a shot at a summit bush. The ice falls melting, it's getting extremely dangerous. I was talking to Ed last night about it and thinking you know maybe I would be willing to lose half a finger or something for the summit um, or half a toe or a toe. You know, it means that much to me. The thing that really did concern me was that Rex had worked so hard for his sponsorship and put so much effort into that. And I was terrified, yeah, I think I was terrified that uh, he would take an, uh, 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 a, a risk, he would just, the risk would just be too much for what he'd given, but Rex is a very giving person, so he would go, and, and I know he would try and get to the top for the sponsors, and, and life's too short for that. Or, you know, my son's life is not worth any sponsorship money. We finally get a forecast to say that the jet stream is slowly moving north away from the summit. Ed and I seize the opportunity and move to Camp 3. That was an amazing, is an amazing sunset. Camp 3, Everest, the night before we go for it. It's just an incredible place. It's just the beauty of creation. It's amazing. I begin to feel anxious, 
knowing that tomorrow we'll have to go higher, all the way to Camp 4. Here I am on the south coal. Tents flapping madly in 60 to 70 knot gusts. It was a hell of a hard climb up today. Probably one of the hardest climbing days of my life. So I'm expecting tomorrow to be about twice as hard. Up here nothing lives, you know. The coal's just barren, it's ridden with old ripped tents and destroyed things and old ice screws, ice axes and even bodies and it's not a very nice place to be. There's snow coming in the top of the tent tomorrow. Sorry, tonight at about 9.30 or 10 o'clock we'll leave for the summit and my legs still feel absolutely shattered from the day. So I'm just trying to eat as much as I can, drink as much as I can, and uh, get as much rest as we can. I don't know how long we can stop here to survive. There's just no air to breathe. Tomorrow is the day that we'll find out exactly what's going to happen. So wish me well. The pressure is incredible. We were woken by Ang Basang, our lead Sherpa. And he was yelling at us in half English, half Nepalese, saying, you've got to go for the summit now. He was saying that there are 30 headlamps on the face above us. And that would be stuck in that queue and we wouldn't make it if we didn't leave right that moment. For the next seven hours, we climb in the dark. The aim is to reach the summit and descend again before the afternoon storms roll in. Between South Cole and the balcony, that I'd locked, I lost my goggles. I knocked them off my head somewhere and I don't know where they went. But I got to the balcony, found out I had no goggles and it was a serious problem because without goggles, firstly, the ambient air temperature will freeze your eyeballs. And I only continued on because I had this pair of sunglasses and I put them over my face and started climbing up. The problem was, was my oxygen mask didn't fit around the sunglasses well and it fogged it up. That fog, well the condensation froze and they became blocks of ice. So the whole time climbing to the summit I was doing this. And while doing that, the wind was blowing from my left and ripping across the summit ridge, which froze my left eyeball open. This was a period of very high anxiety knowing that he was going out there into um, in, in, to, 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 for this big push and that the weather was not perfect. We arrived at the balcony, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and right there and then the 15 people that were in front of us at the time turned around. And that was a big concern of mine because I knew within those 15 people there was got to be some really experienced climbers and they're turning around for a reason. Ed and I decided to keep going past the balcony only because we had this gut feeling that it would get better, it would get better. I remember being up between the balcony and the south summit and it was the hardest section for me. But we are really, really looking forward to the sunrise. I remember it peeking over, over the horizon and it was just beautiful. We could see the whole of Tibet, the Tibetan plains on one side and all of the Himalayas on the other side below you and it's just amazing sitting on the radio going, you know, come on, come on. And any little bit of, of feedback we got through the radio, I'd jump and go, oh, this might be him, this might be him. I remember getting about 20 minutes under the south summit and I was getting close, but at the same time I was feeling, I can't do this. I am physically and utterly exhausted and I needed to decide whether I keep going up or I go back down. But I thought about it and thought, well, if you make the decision to go back down now, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. You couldn't keep thinking about this all the time. You just had to get on with your day-to-day -day tasks, your day-to-day -day work, and, uh, and, and wait for the next uh, communication from Caroline. I was starting to sort of dedicate steps to people and things to take my mind off the physical hurt that I was feeling. And I started to say, this, well, this one's for mum, this one's for dad, this one's for my sponsors, this one's for Caroline. All the people that had helped me out get to where I was. It's very hard to actually envisage what, what, uh, what he's actually going through. And I got to the south summit 
crested the south summit and that was where it all changed. Across the ridge, to the, past the Hillary Step, I could see straight up to the summit. It was less than two hours away. I almost could, you could almost reach out and touch it. Between the south summit and the Hillary Step is a knife edge ridge. On your left hand side, you've got a three vertical kilometre drop into Nepal. On your right hand side, you've got a four vertical kilometre drop into Tibet. So there I was at the bottom of the Hillary Step. This is pretty much a 15 metre vertical section. On your right hand side, you've got a snow wall. On the left hand side, you've got a rock wall and you bridge up between the snow wall and the rock wall and it's vertical. And at that altitude, climbing vertical snow and ice and rock was extremely difficult. But at the same time, I thought, I'm above the Hillary Step. You are now 25 minutes away from the top. You can do this. We got eight feet from the summit. Eight feet, Ed was just behind me. I stopped there. I waited for Ed to come up. He came up and I remember just arming and arming with Ed and walking that eight feet to the top of the world. Ed pulled his dad's ashes out of his pocket and threw them from the top of the world. And that was a really emotional moment for both of us. Well, here I am on the top of Mount Everest and watching Ed just throw his dad's ashes was probably more emotional than getting to the top. And uh, a lot of work has gone into this climb and I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad the camera's working. Oh man, this is one of the hardest days of my life, no doubt. But here we are, it's paid off. It's been really windy, but the wind's calmed down a little bit. And Chung Along has been really kind to us. So I'm really happy. And now it's time to descend because the climb's only half over. The, the worry was not when he reached the top. The worry was him getting back down to the South Coal. Because that's when so many of the accidents tend to happen, on the way down, not on the summit. Every ounce of energy had gone into that summit push and getting back down. I remember being 200 metres away from the South Coal tents, walking 15 steps, just sitting down in the snow for five minutes, just resting, breathing, and then getting back up again, walking another 15, 20 steps, sitting back down again. Here we are back from the summit. What a fantastic day. I mean, it's got to be one of the hardest days of my entire life. And uh, we made it, Ed and I, probably minus 30 degrees, blowing maybe 50 to 60 kilometers at times. I got frostbite on my fingers. I uh, came back down snow blind. So we had a true epic, man. And uh, pretty happy to be back down at the South Coal now and uh, long descent lies ahead of us. This is an amazing day. We took some bad conditions. We went up there and we sent. This is, it makes the ascent all that much sweeter, I think, to have done it in a year when very few people got up and to have done it on a day when very few people got up. You know, in some ways we got a little bit lucky up high that the wind wasn't worse, but man, we pushed ahead and bitter cold and bad winds and just blew it out, man. 
got it done. You. Uh. <coughs> and I got a little bit of a cough. Ooh. The climb wasn't over until you're back down in base camp. So we couldn't celebrate. We got down to camp two and the next day we continued on through the Kumbu Icefall for the last time. And I remember coming out of that icefall and there was my sister waiting in the scree for us. Back down safely from the summit of Mount Everest. Woo! <laughs> oh, out of the icefall, thank God. Um, as it came through the ice wall and it was just really exciting for us both and to see him and just to know that he was safe and that it was over and it was achieved, it was just the most relieving feeling I think I've, I've ever had. Mm. Thank you man, we couldn't have done it without you. Thanks, cheers. Thanks. Couldn't have done it without you, mate. My life changed when I stood on the summit of Mount Everest. The weather wasn't great, the wind was howling. You know, it was freezing cold. But it was a moment that I'll never ever forget and one of the best moments of my life. It's an amazing achievement to reach the top of Mount Everest any time, let alone on your first go. I got the news about Rex when I was driving in my car with my family and I thought about all the times we've been together in the mountains, all the times we've reached the summit and I knew then and there that it would have been the most amazing day of his life. Whatever happens to Rex in his life, he knows that he can succeed against huge odds, but I hope to God it just settles down now. It's a great feeling to finally finish the goal I've been working on for so long. But I just can't wait to get back into the mountains.